and welcome everyone to the Movement Made Better podcast. Today, our guest from over the pond is Dr. Robert Crowley. So we will rock doc Rob. We will turn it over to you, sir. I'm Robert Crowley. I am a chiropractor. I do a number of things. Uh, chiropractor, university lecturer, rock tape instructor, stick mobility instructor. Basically, how I got my start was, God, it was about 30 years ago. I uh, I was a personal trainer. And then eventually, I ended up one of my first patient, uh, clients was a, was a chiropractor. Ironically, he hurt his back. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I was training him and he brought in a little catalog one day and said, oh, maybe you should go into chiropractic. You know, I threw it aside. I wasn't really interested at the time because this was early 90s. Personal training was just sort of starting out and, you know, it was like the hot career to go into and everything. And then a number of my personal training clients were seeing chiropractors and uh, it just kept on coming up and coming up. And then eventually one of my clients asked me to meet her chiropractor to discuss her low back pain. He arranged for a appointment at National College of Chiropractic as in Chicago, uh, as it was called at the time. And um, at that point, I decided that's what I wanted to do. Went to University of Illinois in Chicago, got my bachelor's in exercise physiology because it was you know, interested in exercise, but it was also all the prerequisites for chiropractic school. Mm. So completed my degree there and then you know, started chiropractic school. And um, I've been practicing, graduated in 2002, been practicing uh, since then. In the U.S., I worked for a couple of practices, one inside a gym, and then I worked in interdisciplinary clinic with chiropractors, physical therapists, and medical doctors working all together. And then 2000, around 2008, or actually a little bit earlier than that, somebody brought up about a shortage of chiropractors in the U.K. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Maybe, you know, I could... You know, live abroad for a while and everything. And my, uh, so my wife and I in 2008, you know, came over here and started practicing. And as I started practicing a small uh, practice in the Midlands. And now I'm in, uh, in Norwich, which is about 100 miles outside of London. And then earlier this year, I started lecturing at London South Bank University in their master's of uh, chiropractic program there. And it's an integrated program with physiotherapy, sports, uh, sports rehab, and, and chiropractic all sort of mixed in. Um, so, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Nice. It's nice to hear that the clinical side and the chiropractic side are starting to kind of work together as opposed to being opposite or opposing oh, yeah, de- forces. Definitely. And it's when I worked in the um, with the physical therapists and medical doctors, and it you know opened my eyes to a lot of things in terms of not only the medical treatment and everything, but you know physical therapists working with chiropractors, and you know we use our unique tools. And one of the physical therapists that I uh, worked with one day, he was uh, in sort of our little uh, office area, and he was reading a book, and it was Thomas Meyer's first edition of uh, Anatomy Trains. I think the first edition was in black and white. There wasn't even in colored pictures or anything. And then, you know, that that was a unique experience for me because I was like, what's this uh, you know, fascial lines? What's that all about? In chiropractic school at that time, and, and it, it's still taught that way to some degree, everything was very structural. Mm-hmm. Um, everything had to do with, you know, herniated disc pushing out a nerve and, you know, everything's about structure and uh, sprains and strains. And then it was a little, quite the biomechanical model. You know, they started, you know, talking about, you know, things like, you know, it's all about the glutes. It's all mm-hmm. about or all about the spine and things like that. And when I got out of school, that's that's what it was all about. And then just slowly I started, you know, getting exposed to different things like, you know, anatomy trains. And I was always, when I was in chiropractic school, I started taping, kinesio taping. Um, mm. This Kenzo Kase came from National uh, College of Chiropractic. So we were introduced to it when we were in school. And then when I got exposed to anatomy trains, I thought, well, maybe I can start taping some of these uh, these fascial lines, uh, superficial back line, lateral line, and you know things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, started experimenting with that, and then I think it was around 2011, 2012. I was exposed to to rock tape, mm-hmm. and I thought I was really onto something. But it's turned out that Steve Capobianco was already 
<laughs> doing that. <laughs> so it kind of pissed, pissed me off a little bit. <laughs> and then, so, so if you can't beat them, you join them. <laughs> and then I started with 2013, 14, I started uh, uh, teaching with, uh, with rock tape over here in the UK. And then that's how I got uh, introduced to stick mobility was because you know, Paul Coker stumbled upon uh, in, in your Instagram page. And he said, check out these orange bendy sticks. And, uh, you know, what do you think of that? And then, yeah, then the rest is history. And then, you know, uh, and you guys were over here teaching us and spent a couple of days in a gym with Dennis and Mitchell and, and another two days at a dance studio with, uh, you know, Dennis and Mitchell and felt things I never felt before. And yeah, get, got ridiculed a little bit Dennis from Dennis about my hip mobility. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So that, yeah, that's, that's, that's how it started. But the key is, has it improved? Oh, it has improved See, immensely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. still well. I'm fifty, so I still fight it every day. But but the sticks have made a dramatic difference, and and it's the most more importantly, it's it's made a dramatic difference with my patient. Uh -huh. So I use sticks as a primary rehab tool with my patients. Very nice. Uh, and you know, from you know the person who has a that's an extremely bad way and could barely make it in my office, I'm I'm using the sticks with them to, you know, a uh, advanced athlete, uh, they're using it as well. So yeah, it's just been a, a really great tool, you know, with my patients. And it's just a great, you know, external cue. It's not rehab to them. It's almost like, they, uh, I know Dennis talks about play a lot, you know, it's play, it's something different. Uh, it's something that's something that's outside themselves, especially with chronic pain patients. I found them quite useful because the patient a, a typical chronic pain patient who's had pain, you know, for, for many years, they, they view it as support, but they don't trust their own body, but they trust the stick. Mm -hmm. But if you're able to get them in a position that they've never, that they haven't been able to get into for a while and, and, and not hurt is huge, mm -hmm. you know, with their progression. Well, yeah, because somebody that's been in pain for a long time, asking them to do movement is there. You might as well ask them to give you their firstborn because they're going to be like, no, I don't think so. Yeah, and they, they've been taught or their brain convinced them that that movement is um, is threatening to them. Mm -hmm. um, and see, the, the stick almost you know gives them gives them that illusion of of, of support. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, it does give you support, but. It, it allows you to, you know, switch something on that they haven't been able to, you know, switch on. Mm -hmm. So like you're kind of using them as a building block for their confidence or regaining their confidence again in their movement. Yeah, absolutely. And then when you point it out to them, like, look, you're, you know, you're in, you're in a squat, you know, you weren't able to squat when you walked in the door. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's, it's just that distraction mm -hmm. and everything about them in terms of, you know, the, the color stimulating in a certain way, the, the end of the sticks are, you know, you have the texture to it. It's just providing that, that neurosensory stimulus that, that just uh, distracts the brain and allows them to feel safe. Well, you like personally, your modality of choice for training is CrossFit, correct? Yes. Yes. Have you seen personally yourself, uh, how that has benefited you as far as introducing the sticks with your training? Yeah. So, so when I started in CrossFit, I was about 41 years old. So I've been mm -hmm. doing CrossFit about eight, nine years now, and I'm 50 now. And um, I come from more from bodybuilding background. So I was mm -hmm. bodybuilding for years. I've been lifting weights, you know, to some degree since I was 16. So a good, good 30, 34, 35 years. And, but I did predominantly, uh, you know, bodybuilding type training. Mm -hmm. So everything was very controlled and everything was, you know, very planned. But, you know, from the bodybuilding training, I had the, you know, tight pecs, tight ankles, tight hip flexors and, and, and all that. So starting Olympic weightlifting when you're 41 years old isn't something I would uh, normally recommend. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would have loved to have you know, been exposed to Olympic weightlifting when I was in my teenage years. It would have been a lot easier. But being somebody who was 41 years old, starting the Olympic weightlift and learn, you know, totally new movement patterns was, was a challenge. What the sticks has allowed me to, you know, particularly work on, you know, hip, ankle, you know, shoulder mobility and, and so on, but then get stronger in those positions. So get stronger in those, you know, the bottom of the squat when 
typically I may be weak. Being able to, you know, be in the, in the bottom of a lift and be able to fight that lift and be able to generate the force to get, you know, to, to get out of that lift. And yeah, it's helped, helped me immensely. I mean, I had a baseline strength, you know, for bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. I've always lifted weights, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't say that that was like totally, you know, functional strength and you know for somebody who's 50 and trains five days a week pretty much you know i'm not in pain that often you know mm-hmm. I'm, you know li- little things pop up but i get past it but if something does pop up i usually just get out the sticks and start playing around with them and you know whether it's my shoulders low back or you know you know whatever the stick i always feel better after doing the stick well i looked at that point though you said you know things do pop up i think a lot of people have this perception when they follow people on social media that, oh, these people never have issues, but mm-hmm. no, we things do pop up on us. It's not like we yeah. get up every day, we're pain-free, we move really fluidly and we don't have any issues. No, like Neil and I, we there's injuries that take place, but it's the fact that when it does take place, we don't freak out about it. We yeah. kind of, we use it as a learning tool and we go, okay, this is what's going on and this is my plan of attack on how to yeah. recover from it. Yeah. And and usually when something pops up, it's usually because I've been, you know, lazy about something, you know, maybe I haven't been, you know, doing my, you know, everyday maintenance. Maybe I'm not spending that much time in 90, 90 shin box position, Mm -hmm. you know, things like that. And, you know, just a couple, you know, work on them, work on some things for a few days and, you know, I feel a lot better. But the one thing I probably the, the most consistent thing I've done since I've been been training, you know, since I was 16 years old, I probably haven't been taken off longer than, you know, two weeks ever. Oh, you know, really? I always find a way to work around, you know, that movement. If I'm, you know, I have an injury or if I'm a little niggle or whatever, as they call them over here, um, I'll, I'll work around it. I'll find picking up a, a snatch off the floor. Things are a little tight that day. I might just, you know, do it from the hang or I might do it from blocks or, mm-hmm. or, or, you know, do a dumbbell snatch instead of, you know, you know, barbell snatch. You know, I always have like something that I can fall back on. I think part of it's just being creative with, with movement. And I've probably done every single weight training exercise that, that you can think of. But then sticks was like just something totally new for me. You know, that was just a new, new modality. Um, and, uh, and then I, you know, first started using it with myself and started using it with my patients. And for the last, you know, four years, it's been almost four years to the day that, you know, spent four days with Dennis and Mitchell and, um, yeah, I've been using them ever since. Nice. Yeah. It's good that you bring up that point of adaptability, improvisational skills. A lot of what you talked about is just change, simply changing the angles and the levers to the positions where your body's still good with it. And I think that's something that people need to hear more of because a lot of people, when things do happen, they usually just avoid it. They go, okay, well, I just won't do that instead of trying to figure out, okay, what doesn't bother me and what can I still work with? And that's one of the biggest mistakes a lot of people make when they, when they have an injury is they say, okay, well, I'm going to rest. Or Mm -hmm. when I moved over to the UK, I, I found the these sort of protocols for injuries with with the NHS when they see the GP. So, mm-hmm. so somebody hurts their back and let's say, oh, I hurt my back doing a deadlift. Of course, the GP is going to say, don't do a deadlift. <laughs> but but what they'll say, oh, well, you need to rest for three weeks. So you still need to rest. And they, they oh, if it's still bothering you in three weeks, you know, call us back or, you know, what have. And then if they, if you know, they might have told them to take, you know, ibuprofen or, you know, whatever. Pain's still there after three weeks. They'll call their GP. They, they maybe get a appointment with the physio. Some of those things are changing now and some of the protocols are changing, uh, w- w- which is good. But what they've created is almost this fear avoidance behavior that deadlift mm-hmm. becomes the obstacle. And, you know, my philosophy on, you know, lifting weights and like the deadlift, you shouldn't be afraid of deadlifting. You should be more afraid of not deadlifting. Mm-hmm. So of course you don't have to, you know, throw 200 kilos on the bar, but there is a way to, you know, modify. Of course they need to change the name of the deadlift because that just sounds scary to start out with. But you know, the deadlift is just, just a hip. It's, <laughs> it's, a hip very, true. it's yeah. very true. You know, yeah, so it's, it's just, funny just a hip yeah. inch, but we need, we need to pick up, pick up stuff off the floor. Yeah. You definitely yeah, that load is one of those things that still people are afraid of. Mm-hmm. And they think that as they get older, they shouldn't be lifting or if they're lifting, it shouldn't be heavy load. Of course, you need to gradually build up to that load. 
but it's really like load is a stimulus just like any other movement. Yeah, load is part of the healing process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but when they have when people have those peaks and valleys and trainings, that's when you get into that that vicious cycle of injury. You so you have an injury, you rest, and then they go back to the the activity and they have that lower tissue tolerance. And then they think they still have that old tissue tolerance and they mm-hmm. try to load it the same way and they can. So they get injured again. So they take more time off. And then eventually it's just this vicious cycle instead of their tolerance being here, tissue tolerance. Now it's down here and they end up in this sort of perpetual cycle. Ultimately, they get afraid of working out because every time they, they work out, you know, they get hurt and then it just ends up in this, you know, this chronic pain. Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny what you said about renaming the deadlift. It, it did. It is. It's an intimidating name. So when you bring that up to people, you kind of see their facial reaction, especially if they have a history with it. There's the old, you know, when you mention it. So, and there's so many nuances. So it's interesting instead of saying, okay, just avoid debt, just avoid the movement instead of saying, Say instead, say, hey, there's get a coach, get a trainer that really can teach you the nuances of how to do this thing optimally. You know? Yeah, I'm very fortunate that I have like uh, where, where my clinic is in, inside a CrossFit gym. So I practice at one in London, Sports Injury Clinic, London. It's so- Sonia is uh, is one of mm-hmm. the owners, which which you met, and then here here in Norwich, Gain Fitness in Norwich. But you know, right outside my door is I, I have a gym floor. You know, so, uh, you know, I, if there are any issues with lifting, we'll go lift and we'll, you know, watch you lift and we'll find a progression to, you know, lift, you know, lift that weight off the floor or your head or, 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 or what have you. But yeah, it's avoiding that fear of, of that activity that's going to make you better. I had a patient, um, last summer. This was during after one of the, the COVID lockdowns and she was somebody who uh, hurt her back at, at a, quite a serious disc injury. She, she was a strong, uh, she competes in strong women. And she came into my office thinking uh, that she would never be able to compete again. We just slowly exposed her to movements. I just started her showing, her. Uh, you know, we just did some, you know, uh, we did some stick stuff, of course, but we did, you know, just some little, you know, hip hinge with single arm Romanian deadlifts some loaded carries and, you know, various things and just exposing her to, to light load. We were locked down again over here in November and then again, December through March uh, uh, last year. She was just, you know, using an empty barbell in, in her um, in her flat. She was just exposing herself, you know, to the movements again. She was also working with a, a strength coach at her strength gym. Uh, about two weeks ago, she she competed again. Nice. Uh, awesome. And and even you know prior to the competition, she had she was having a little bit of sort of like glute performance pain, and she was concerned going in and. She saw me just a little treatment, a little bit of exam. I think everything's okay. You know, you'll be able to to compete. I don't think you're gonna, you know, do any more damage. So she ended up competing and you know and, and did did rather well. And it was just mostly things like overhead log lifts and you know, things like that. And then she was a little sore afterwards, but she mm-hmm. she got through it and you know, things subsided after a couple of days. And now she's, you know, making plans on the things that she needs to improve in order to to compete, but and then ultimately competing in strongman, you're always going to have some degree of, you know, uh, soreness and, you know, pain throughout the process, but she's to the point where she knows that she'll be okay. And it's, it's just very reassuring to her rather than being in that cycle where I'm just going to avoid, you know, doing what I love. And um, yeah, I'm just uh, yeah, really well proud of her because she, you know, persevered through things and she had some obstacles along the way, but, you know, she's doing what she loves. And, uh, you know, that's what, what the most important thing is. Very nice. Awesome. So when you first started uh, chiropractic school, I know strength training is a big part of your program. Was that a big emphasis back then? The funny thing about chiropractic school, there's in the education, it, it, I don't think there was a huge emphasis uh, on it, but it seemed to attract a lot of people who were, you know, bodybuilders or power lifters and things like that. And now I think a lot of you know, CrossFit uh, athletes are attracted to uh, uh, chiropractic as well. So it just always seemed to tra- attract those type of, uh, of of students. In the curriculum, we probably didn't spend like a huge, yeah, we, you know, we did, re- but it was, we did rehab, but it wasn't a traditional rehab, you know, so it was, you know, resist the balls and balance boards and, and, you know, dead bugs and uh, um, 
bird dogs and, you know, planks and things like that. But there wasn't a huge emphasis on strength training. Mm. It's something that I like to sort of, you know, weave into to how I teach um, as far as, you know, the importance of, and, you know, getting strong and making, um, you know, making the, the treatment something that's meaningful to them. You know, so if some, if, if a patient of mine is, you know, likes to lift weights, I'm going to work that into the rehab. Or mm. of course, if my patient's a runner, I'm going to work running in, into that. But that runner, I'm just going to try to get them turned on to lifting uh, mm-hmm. to, to some degree. It's something that I've always, you know, because of my background, I have a degree in exercise physiology. And I had a, I was fortunate to have a really good biomechanic teacher, uh, functional anatomy teacher at, at UIC. His name was Dr. Terry Sattler. And he was actually one of the, he was a uh, dentist like this. He was like, a one of the original strength coaches before there were strength coaches in the NHL with the Blackhawks. Oh, okay. So he was a strength coach with the Blackhawks during, you know, he's Stan and, uh, oh, uh, you nice. know, sort of Bobby Hull times. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, so he would tell stories about work with the Blackhawks. He was actually working with the, uh, the Cubs during the eighties when Dallas green was the general manager and, and he was, you know, he would tell stories about, you know, we work with the Cubs and things like that. But he he's the one that uh, he sort of taught taught me how to watch somebody move. So he's first day of class. He's like, no, there's no textbook. We're just going to try to figure out. Uh, we're going to do I'm a little teapot and try to figure out the movements and the prime movers and and, and like all that. But he taught taught me how to 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 like you know, look, uh, look at somebody move and, and, and what's involved in that movement. And he used to always tell stories too about Tim Grover, Michael Jordan's trainer, because mm-hmm. he came through like the same program as us. So we do, he would tell us, so this was like, uh, when I was there, it was like late nineties. So this is when, you know, I was there like 96, 97, 98. So toward, you know, the last dance type stuff, but he'd always talk about Tim Grover and how Tim Grover, you know, he wanted to be a trainer for athletes before there was trainer trainers for athletes, mm-hmm. you know, and how he started, he somehow got his way in with the bulls and meeting Michael Jordan and like all that stuff, which was, which was kind of cool, cool. But yeah, he just, you know, just taught us how to don't look at a textbook and just try to figure it out, try to figure out, you know, movement. And I've, I've used that you know, to my day. To, to this day, even when I'm teaching my students at the university, I try to get get them to figure things out as opposed to reading in a book or what have you. Yeah, there's a lot of, and that's the thing is, it's where yeah. are they sourcing the movement from? Yeah. You know, it's it's I use the analogy, you know, in the restaurant industry, in the food industry, it's the farm to table concept, right? Mm-hmm. You want to know where your supply chain is and where everything is coming from. It, it the same thing when you're looking at the way somebody moves. You want to see where is it being sourced from? Is it being sourced from an area that you would like it to be or is it not? And if it isn't, then you go back and you say, okay, you tried to produce this movement from this area of the body. We'd like you to produce it from this area of the body. And I think that's where, where the sticks come in. Uh, stick mobility comes in you know, quite, quite well is the fact that instead of using those internal cues and think you tell somebody shoulder blades back and down and then you know, they've, they can't feel it. Mm-hmm. But if you just have them push down into the stick, you know, boom, it already happens. Mm-hmm. Or if you tell them to, you know, squeeze your glutes or squeeze their abs or or whatever, which uh, that's debatable, not not really a good cue anyway. But if you tell them to, you know, push that stick down, you know, your body will will take what it needs, you know, from the given. Yeah, the the tool or the the stick is just just a perfect tool to teach movement or get get them to feel their body. But the thing that you know, when, when I was going, you know, learning about anatomy trains and things like that, and that totally made, made sense from a structural pers- perspective. But then they started, you know, the last, you know, five years, they're thinking, oh, maybe it's not a structural thing. Maybe it's more a neurologic thing. Mm-hmm. And, and that's how the body organizes, you know, the, these movements. So I'm really excited about, you know, where research is going about, you know, how, how fascia is, is really involved in that 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 bottom up top down you know uh, organization of, of movement and but that sensory and feeling it uh, is is so crucially important to that and we i think we think about i think a lot of times movement is thought of too much 
you know, top down all the time, but if you forget about how, how important it is to feel mm-hmm. and move, movement helps you feel mm-hmm. movement in a way is a, is a, is a form of, as, as a form of touch. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, we're t- when we talk about fascia, I mean, that's something that we think the industry gets more in tune to what it is, what it's important is. Do you think that that's going to go a long way to really helping improve even just everyday people's pop, the general population, their day to day functions? Oh, oh a- absolutely. Um, but I think the, the, the crucial, what, what, what will be crucial for, for this to progress, I think will be, you know, getting the research. Uh, mm-hmm. behind it more or less getting the research of the mechanisms behind it because i think that's where we're lacking in terms of at least in like chiropractic treating musculoskeletal problems and things everything was about pain mm-hmm. so whether or not a given treatment is effective is if they're in pain and then they're out of pain uh, and pain pain can be very subjective pain is very personal to somebody pain is not the same in, in every person but then I think what's crucially important is, is, you know, with movement, with fascia, things like that is understanding like the neurological mechanisms, you know, behind that. Mm-hmm. So with fascia, you know, first it was, you know, a little bit more structural. They're thinking it's more in terms of adhesions. And then they were thinking, and now it's a little bit more toward neurosensory, but then there's also the fluid din- dynamics with, with mm-hmm. fascia as well that's you know crucially important and what happens when you know something you know that fascial gliding isn't you know necessary what is was it should is this neurological or is it doing due to you know what they thought was adhesions or is it due to fluid dynamics you know or is it a combination of all, all, all those things um, i do think that there's a little bit too much criticism on Line and Instagram and things like that, where you know something's not evidence based, but so we can't necessarily try that because it's you know it's 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 not in the evidence. But which in the UK, a, a lot of practitioners will won't try something unless it's been proven in the evidence. Well, and sometimes the evidence takes you know a good five, ten, twenty years before there's enough evidence to say mm-hmm. something is is is, is viable. And that's probably the biggest difference from when I was practicing in the U.S. The U.S. physical therapists, chiropractors, medical doctors, et cetera, were, were taught to be scientists in terms of using our scientific knowledge and trying to apply it to the situation, you know, f- apply it to the patient. Whereas over here, it's a little bit more, well, this is what the evidence says. If the evidence says it, then you can, you know, you can try it on a patient. So, I'm sort of like caught in the middle. I think the evidence is important, but in the meantime, I'm going to try some, you know, crazy shit, uh, you know, <laughs> every now and then. So as long as it's not, you know, going to uh, you know put the patient in, in, in harm's yeah. way, I'm going to try, you know, I'm going to try using the sticks. I'm going to try to, you know, use a soft, soft tissue techniques. I'm going to put some tape on them, you know, whether or not, you know, some people think that that's, that's evidence-based or not. If, if the patient feels better and I can reproduce an improvement or show them an improvement, I'm, I'm going to use that. And so I'm going to typically use my manual therapy techniques as just a window to move them in, in, in that same session. So I'm not a typical chiropractor where I'll just, just adjust them and you know, send them on their way. I'm going to adjust. I might use a little bit of tape. I do a little bit of soft tissue, but then I'm going to, you know, hand them a stick right after that and, you know, try to use that input that I just uh, gave them. So is this something that you'll recommend to your, your chiropractic students as far as your own methodology? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like pretty much uh, every session I'll, I'll throw in like a little uh, clinical vignette and something I've done and something, you know, that I find effective and, and yeah. And I try to just teach, teach them what, what I do and yeah, if they choose to use it and, and, and try it, you know, I'm all, all for it. You know, when I teach, it's about, I try to make it as practical as possible, but at the same time, I want them to, you know, explore a little bit and, you know, put their own spin on things. Cause I've taken things from a lot of different places, you know, whether it is, you know, things like I've used things that, you know, Gray Cook has done. I've, I was a big proponent of Stuart McGill. I, you know, use, use, use some of his stuff and, you know, I use sticks, I use tape, I use a lot of different things and, you know, try to, you know, get my patients, you know, better, but I want them to find their own, you know, sort of way. 
I don't want them to be like a cookie cutter of, you know, mm-hmm. of, of myself. But then the biggest thing for me has been the fact that I use my, you know, weight training and strength training and things like that has always been a, in the beginning wasn't as much of a part of my practice, but but now it's a pretty big part of you know of my practice and I try to bring my past into it and uh, you know use it with my patients now. Strength training is key in the fact that people in everyday life, you go to pick up a couch, you better be strong. No, absolutely. You know, I mean you, you can't be afraid to go, okay, I can't help you move that couch. Why not? Well I might hurt myself. So yeah. it's it's just getting mentally confident to be able to do just quote unquote normal movement that you might need in a day-to-day experience. Yeah. I mean, yesterday I went to the grocery store and, you know, it's about like 400 meters from my house, maybe a little bit farther. And, you know, I had like two heavy sacks I'm carrying and, you know, I'm doing farmer's carry for, you know, 400 meters, you know, probably halfway in between. I had to like, you know, switch hands a little bit, you know, (laughs) got, got the heavy bag on the other side and like all that. But, you know, the end, my, you know, my shoulders, my, you know, my, my forearms and everything was, you know, I was, I was feeling it, but you know, that was, you know, yeah, that's, that's functional. One thing that I noticed though, like during, um, like we had a pretty, yeah, well, California, you guys had a pretty extensive lockdown, but we were locked down for, you know, quite a while. And there was so the first part of lockdown, my, my practice had to shut for about 12, 13 weeks. And then I didn't have access, you know, to, to the gym. Mm-hmm. Um, which I was still doing some things, you know, back in my garden, you know, I had dumbbells, I had my sticks and I was, I was doing various things. I'd go to, you know, we'd go to the track and we would do, you know, you know, different things and stuff. But the biggest thing that I was missing was, was that like the barbell overhead or hanging from a pull-up bar and then brachiation and things like Mm -hmm. that. Just that being gone for like 12 weeks, I was like, you know, holy shit. How important is that? Because it mm-hmm. was in my life for so long and then it was gone, even though I was like, you know, doing some pretty hard workouts, you know, with, you know, with some dumbbells and, you know, things like that. I was, I was still, you know, when you, your 40 minute sticks classes and, you know, things like that, mm-hmm. but yeah, nothing replicated a heavy snatch over your head. I, I mean, I tried doing, yeah. I remember my first snatch, you know, as, after I got access to the gym, after my, uh, my practice was able to put back up and I was at just 40 kilo snatch. And I was like, holy shit, this, <laughs> it's, it, it shouldn't have felt like that. You know, I'm just trying to like hold that bar overhead and, and it didn't feel like, feel like 40 kilos. And it wasn't necessarily the weight. It, it was the movement and the timing of everything, mm-hmm. but then how specific certain movements are. And, and if they're, you can replicate it as much as possible with other things, but sometimes you need that that specific you know, movement. And, but then I thought about a lot of the people that were coming back into the gyms after lockdowns, after not being able to train and things like that, and you know how that was going to impact them, or how was that going to impact you know their overall musculoskeletal health, as they say in America. How how was that going to impact them? And like chiropractic clinics and things like that over here are just slammed with people, you know, because I think a lot of it was just that lack of movement, you know, had a dramatic impact or they had their everyday life where they were, you know, going to the office and things like that. But now they're working from home and, you know, their commute is from, you know, their bedroom down to their bedroom office or dining room table, you Mm -hmm. know, so how much is that going to impact, you know, their overall health? And yeah, it's just, yeah, it was, it was just quite the eye opener to see how, how variable your your movement is and then you all of a sudden take it take it away in, in, in some way and how how that impacts you not only physically but you know mentally and emotionally yes. as well yeah i'm wondering how many people you know right after the lockdown you know went to the gym and tried to go back to the same exact weights that they were doing yeah. and yeah, then yeah, got probably. injured yeah absolutely i mean not that you know weightlifting is is statistically dangerous but i'm sure the there was an increase in you know you know a few little injuries and things and you know and some people are i know they're still struggling back to get to the same fitness level that they were and it's been i think gyms have been open here since april you know so it's still seven months and yes people are still struggling to get back to it yeah i think it's people don't have an idea of how quickly the body can decondition. And then, you know, if you take three, four weeks away from something, Mm -hmm. then how much you've regressed and how much you actually need to take time to get back to your previous levels. 
Yeah. And I think a lot of the, like somebody who has like a, a pretty wide training age, I think it, it won't take them quite as long or they're not going to have deterioration that somebody who's only, let's say somebody really been hitting it hard for a year. They've only been doing it for a year. Mm-hmm. They, I think they were going to be impacted, you know, probably mm-hmm. most. But then somebody, you know, like I've been training for 30 years and it had an impact on me, mm-hmm. but not as much as I think, you know, you know, some people. So it's, it's it, the whole, yeah, the whole, you know, lockdown scenario was just, you know, quite fascinating in terms of everything really. But even in terms of we're very social creatures and all of a sudden mm-hmm. we were told, you know, that, you know, we can't yeah. be social, but then also lacking that in, in terms of lacking that physical touch with people, I think had, had a tr- dramatic impact, which could impact pain scenarios as well. Well, and there's people now that are conditioned to stay at home and they're, they're afraid to go out. And yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And, and especially people who are, you know, already anxious about going out and just mm-hmm. throw in that. Yeah. It's, it's uh, yeah. We're going to see the implications of these, you know, the last two years for many years, I would say. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. You're going to see some serious, you know, over the next three or four years, we're going to see what the results or what the consequences of those, that, those decisions that our government's made to the general population. You know, I was talking to an oncologist and he was telling me that there's a lot of patients who are going to, he says the patients coming to him are, uh, their cancers are a little further along, you know, mainly mm. because, you know, the, the healthcare system being under, you know, so much stress that they couldn't get to see their, uh, you know, their primary care physicians and, you know, get the appropriate referrals or, or here you get a lot of older people who are like, no, I don't want to be a burden on anybody. So I'm not, you know, I, I think that, you know, my GP is very busy or I don't want to go to the hospital, you know, things like that. And, uh, and then, you know, they let things go, you know, so they let that pain they're feeling or that, you know, change in their body bowel or bladder or something. And then, you know, next thing you know, and they have a pretty, you know, far advanced uh, cancer. Mm. So, you know, that, that will definitely have an impact on things. Well, we had, we had had uh, Dr. Ali on and talking about mental conditions, Mm -hmm. depression, Mm -hmm. increased rates of suicide. So not just the physical aspect, but you know, that emotional uh, aspect also. Well, yeah. Like you were talking about how, you know, people are walking from their bedroom to their office instead of getting their whatever it was 7000 10000 steps a day you know that has mm-hmm. such a big impact on you psychologically yeah and in in london as like my my patients in london like seeing them throughout the the pandemic and they would get excited about going to the chiropractor because that's the only time they could get out you know because we were considered uh, essential healthcare workers so they were allowed to go see their chiropractor and um in london you know the the apartments are, are very small mm-hmm. uh, yep. and uh, because the apartments are very small, just like any, you know, a big city in the world, they have a pretty vibrant social life. You know, they, mm-hmm. they go out to eat a lot, you know, they go to the pub and, you know, they have, you know, all different, they go to the gym, you know, so they have all these different social activities and all of a sudden they're, they're work, working at home. They're uh, working out in, in, in their lounge or living room and, you know, they're not going to work. They're not going to the pub and things. And it was a really struggle for, you know, a, a, a lot of them emotionally mm. you know, be, because of that. In Norwich, where I live, you know, people have bigger houses and things. And even though it was a struggle for them compared to you know people in London, it was like nowhere near as, uh, as, as devastating you know, to them. Um, London's, you know, starting now, you know, getting back to, nearly what it was not quite as many tourists like when when dennis was here but mm. it's it, it's starting to get back it's good to see ba- everybody back outside and yeah try to get back to things the way things used to be yeah yeah hopefully it'll it'll stay that way in your practice with chiropractic you use you know tape kinesio tape sticks and, and soft tissue work when you're recommending to anybody listening what they should be looking for in a chiropractor, we do know that there are the chiropractors that are structured to see, they want to see X amount of clients every day. Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, it's the same adjustment essentially for yeah, each yeah. person, even though they say, well, this is catered specifically to you. You know, what should somebody who's interested in chiropractic be looking for in a chiropractor? 
I generally think that they should be looking for a chiropractor who's going to, first of all, spend some time with them um, and not give, that's why, as you say, not give like a cookie cutter, you know, type treatment. Mm-hmm. Not only is he going to spend a lot of time, you know, taking a history, doing a proper exam, but explaining the condition to them and not being necessarily, you know, a salesperson and trying to get 200, 300 patient visits, you know, a week. There are a mm-hmm. lot of good chiropractors who spend their time, tailor the treatment plan, but then offer a little bit more than, than you know, just the manipulation or the chiropractic happy meals, I call it, which used to be manipulation, muscle stim, maybe a little ultrasound, some hot packs and, and the massage table. You know, they, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of other things that are potentially more effective, but then the most important thing is a chiropractor that's going to get them make treatment more active. So you can't solve an active problem by just by passive treatment. I do some manual therapy. I like to use the concept of teach, touch, and move. So I'm going to teach you something about, I'm going to teach you about your condition. How did it come on and what you need to do in order to, to improve? But then I'm going to touch in terms of manual therapy. So I might do some soft tissue work. I might do a bit of dry needling. I might, I might adjust. But then it's always going to finish with, you know, something active. So I, I want to use, you know, that therapeutic touch as quickly as possible. But then I'm going to help reinforce that by what you do. You know, so typical appointment for me, treatment with me is about uh, 30 minutes where I'll do a little, little bit of manual therapy and we'll spend some time moving. But what are you going to do the rest, you know, that other 23 and a half hours of the day? Are you going to, mm-hmm. you know, are you going to recover well? Are you going to sleep properly? Are you going to, to eat well? But then what else are you doing in terms of exercise mm-hmm. to you know, load the body, you know, whether it is, you know, the proper load intensity and so on, a variety of movements. So just somebody who's going to use a number of different modalities or at least have somebody that they you know, in their clinic that can provide those things as well. Um, mm-hmm. So whether it is a, you know, interdisciplinary clinic or, or so on, but an adjustment can, you know, will help. You'll feel a little mm-hmm. bit better, but do you need that same adjustment every time you, you, you know, come in? No, may, you know, may, maybe not. It's, it's just going to be a matter of, yeah, just unfortunately you have to shop around a little bit. UK is a little bit different in terms of, you know, everything's from, so we're outside the NHS. Some chiropractic clinics actually they do a little bit of NHS work, but I've actually haven't used, you know, electrical stim and ultrasound and things like that since I've been in this country. And that was actually oh. kind of new for me. And I was like, hmm, my outcomes haven't changed at all. Maybe we're using those things because of you can build the insurance company for them. Uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. So, you know, I haven't, yeah, I haven't used those modality since I've been here. When I go, my patients just play, pay me a flat rate, you know, for that visit. Mm-hmm. And then I use, you know, whatever modality or thing that I, I, I feel, you know, will benefit them. So it was nice being, you know, out of that system a little bit. And I don't necessarily believe in that sort of like menu treatments and, oh, I want this, this, and this. I think as a professional, we should determine, you know, what's best for that patient. But of course, that patient needs to have buy-in to what you're doing mm-hmm. uh, as well. So if, if they don't feel manipulation is going to work for them or it hasn't worked in the past, then I'll de-emphasize that part of treatment. I might try something else. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, because I used to work at a, one of the first facilities I worked at was right next to a chiropractor who typically wanted to see at least 150 patients a day when he was in office. Damn. I mean, it was just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not uncommon. And it was always to me, it seemed like, because I would train clients that w- would use him as their chiropractor. And it always seemed like every quarter there was a new thing that he was trying to sell them. Like, yeah, take, yeah. take this supplement and it'll really help. And, blah, and so it was more like you get that flavor. Like, he's just more like a salesperson. He's just trying to think of the monetary, you know, selling stuff yeah, yeah. as opposed to really treating the patient. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, of course, it's a business, but I think that you can, you know, have a valuable business 
with just giving the patients what they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it might, you know, I don't see as many patients, but I'm always going to uh, get a referral, you know, for my patients. I'm going to, you know, whenever something comes up with that patient, they're always going to be, you know, you know, back to see me. So I think I, I like thinking a little bit more in terms of the long game. You know, mm. a lot of the very high volume clinics, a lot of times they're fighting for those 50 new patients every mm. month. They always mm -hmm. have to get 50 new patients yes. rather than, you know, trying to, you know, pull in from people that you've, you've treated well and you've treated properly. So I think there's a good way to have an ethical, evidence informed, viable practice that, that you don't necessarily need to fall, you know, victim to, you know, chiropractic marketing schemes or, mm -hmm. you know, physical therapy marketing schemes or whatever, that there's good systems and ways, you know, to do it ethically and to help the patients. Well, thank you for coming on, man. We appreciate it, brother. It was no a great problem. conversation, man. Any new books you're reading lately that uh, you so, might want to recommend? So I read um, Daniel Lieberman's uh, Exercise. Oh, that's oh, good, that's huh? That was yeah, good, huh? Yeah, I love that book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that was really, I've always liked Daniel Lieberman stuff, but that, but that one was a good one because in terms of, it was a good survey of the history of movement and man. And the coolest thing about that book was, I don't want to give away the ending, but people are inherently lazy. Mm -hmm. oh, it's very true. Oh, it's, it's true. <laughs> and, it's and they want energy to use conversation. On conservation, that's what it is, right? Yeah, exactly. And but that's the that's where move, moving well comes in, you yeah. know, because there's a bit of debate on like, oh, is, is there a proper form to do things and you know, all that. And there's like a lot of people say, oh, it's not important and poor form doesn't lead to injuries and things like that. But I think the biggest thing about moving well is the fact that when you move well, you, you use as little energy as possible. Mm -hmm. So that should be your motivation. So exercise doesn't have to be so hard. If you move well, you use less energy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a Simple great that. book. Definitely recommend that to anyone listening out there. Daniel Lieberman's work is really good. We always enjoy reading his stuff. There's another, the another one? good one, like if you're interested in the body as well, is it's called the uh, the body by Bill Bryson. And he's he's like a sort of like a historian, but he tells stories in such a like somebody who's like more of a medical background will, will enjoy the book. Somebody who has no like scientific medical background will enjoy the book. But he just goes through the body, just every single part of the body and just tells little stories about, oh, cool. you know, the history of different, you know, surgical techniques to the story of antibiotics to like all types of cool stuff. And there was actually some really cool stuff about viruses and vaccines, which, which, uh, uh, and this was came out like before COVID, uh, which is yeah, yeah, quite, quite interesting. Uh, yeah. It's very good read. Very good. I'll have to check that out. So, yeah. How can people get a hold of you? Any social media outlets that you have? So you you could uh, get a hold of me at Jack Cairo on Instagram. Um, that was I, I switched my name not, not not too long ago. Yeah, at Jack Cairo on Instagram. I'm also at uh, the Sports Injury Clinic uh, in London and GainRecovery.co.uk. Fantastic. Right. Well, I know it's uh, in the evening over there for you, so we do uh, yeah, enjoy it. Thank yeah. you very yeah, much thanks for, for joining us. On. We appreciate it, brother. Yeah, I like and, the Bears uh, cap. Well, it may be going in the garbage soon. I don't know. I <laughs> might know, become a Lions fan. I might become a Lions fan. <laughs> a li oh, you can't be a Lions fan. But if I jump the team, I got to go to a losing. I got to go to, as I don't want anybody to say I'm a, I'm a bandwagon jumper. So I'm going to pick an organization that that expects to lose all the time and i figure See, well I, well you, you are know. from buffalo though aren't you well i am i am and, yeah i know uh, you are you know I mean, buffalo uh, people are like, just like used Neil's to losing. 49ers he's got enough super bowl titles he, yeah to he keep grew up going. spoiled he totally yeah. grew up spoiled 94 yeah. is a long time ago though yeah it's pretty yeah, yeah. it's pretty interesting to think that they're coming up on almost 30 years of no super bowl ring Oh, that's crazy. It is. It's crazy. Yeah. Like you're only a few mind. years away. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're what the, the bears are. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> we're, oh, it's, <laughs> shit. That, that's 45 years, is it? Something like that. Uh, 85, no, 35, 35 years. 35 years. years. Yeah, dude. We're almost, yeah. we're almost coming up to our 40th anniversary of no Super Bowl. Yeah. It's crazy. And we, expe and we expected multiple from that, from that time frame. Yeah, we did. We, oh, and, we yeah, did. And that's, that's unfortunate. That's really oh, yeah. unfortunate because yeah. they, 88 we could have, but then of course the, the Niners beat us, you know, so. Good Niners. <laughs> <laughs>
Show Montana, baby. And now I live. <laughs> and what's funny is watching that going, I hate the Niners. And then ending up living in Niner country. It's like, mm. it's yeah, like yeah. yeah. It is yeah. hard. I, and I still, it, even if I wanted to, I just can't root for the Niners. Like, yeah. I, I find well, it, it's a struggle. Well, ne- next year we have the White Sox. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll they got see the wrong about man. that. <laughs> yeah, and the Bulls are doing pretty good this year. The Bulls aren't bad this year. Yeah, Bulls aren't bad. The good. Bulls aren't bad. I'll tell you what, the the Warriors, the Warriors are back strong. The Warriors this year. Back. I think I, I think oh. the Bulls play them next week. I think. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. The Warriors are back strong. Yeah, they look oh, good yeah, without yeah. without Clay. Without oh Weisman. my God! So when they get poor, those poor two Clay back, Thompson, seventy six best player in the league <laughs> in the history yeah. of the NBA. I'll tell you what. Okay, Gary Payton the second. Oh, oh yeah, seriously, the guy's a beast. Like, how is this guy taking this? How circuitous of a route to get to this point in his career? Oh, I know. Yeah, I mean, he's been around for a while. It's not like he just got drafted. No, I think yeah, five yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. But you watch him, and you're like, how are you not like, dude? He he plays defense. Yeah, well, that's what I like and- about. It. I think this year we're. They're letting him play defense again. Yeah. And James Harden's having a hard time with that. <laughs> James Harden's like, I don't I don't even know how to say that word. He's yeah. like, I don't even know what defense what he's like, uh, well he's not getting his foul calls, man. That's yeah. for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is he yeah. lives on the free throw yeah. line. He gets a lot of his points from the free throw line. Yeah, yeah. So he's he, um, but, yeah. but I'm definitely liking um DeRozan though. DeRozan has been yeah. the, the big difference with the Bulls. Yeah. Chicago sports, other than other than the Bears, uh, the Blackhawks, I expected to be much better. They are off to a terrible start, oh, not just on the ice, but off the ice too. But that's a whole, that, yeah, that's a total that's a total horrible. other subject. Yeah. But well, they just fired their coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll see if that changes things around. But I expected them. To, I expected them to be substantially better than the, what they're doing right now. But uh, I mean, the thing, thing about Chicago, though, is like usually you have like you know. You have one team that's not doing well. There's always somebody who's like, you know, you know, to be somebody to be interested in. Not the Cubs, but you know, some some, <laughs> you know, if the if the Sox aren't good, the Bulls will be good. You know? Right? And, yeah. You, you know, know, if the Bears are kind of good, then you know, that that makes you feel good for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right, brother. So, well. Uh, okay. Cool. We'll, nice seeing we'll you. Let you go. Yep. Great seeing you. Yep. And uh, we'll you. chat Thanks again soon, me. man. Yeah. Take care. All right, buddy. All right, cheers. And uh, to all the listeners out there, until next episode, be good to each other. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. And whatever platform you're on, either Apple, iTunes, or Spotify, please, if you could leave a review, we'd appreciate that. If you have any questions that we can answer for you, be sure to leave those in the comments also. If you're looking for more information on our education, our products, please go to www.stickmobility.com. And also hit that subscribe button to that YouTube channel. And don't forget our live Instagram classes three times a week. If you want to join in, grab your sticks and hit that 45-minute class. Yes.